Oh, it's good to see you, Shiloh. It's good to sit down for tea with you. Oh, man. I've wanted to do this for so long, and I don't know why it took me this long. I couldn't even begin to explain the journey of why it's taken us this long to sit down and drink some tea this year, but we're doing it, and, uh, and it's good to be here. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad that we got to do it um, when the pandemic initially started, too. Yeah, so we've had tea twice already, which, yeah, uh, yeah so that's been nice. Um, that's what uh, kind of life has been um, heating up to is sharing tea with everyone, just going through all of the wonderful tea friends and connecting and uh, delving deeper into the meaningful aspects of what's important during this time. Totally. And I think it's going to be, it's, it's so interesting kind of in these little threads seeing how everyone's kind of unfolding within that, you know, like th there's obviously like, there's this, this community of people who are all interested in this thing and are kind of all interacting with each other at different moments. Um, and it's really interesting just to see where everybody, where everybody's at at any given point, how we're all kind of moving through these weeks and months and seasons as uh, like going through these various waves of, of, of just involvement or engagement or, or just, you know, different emotions, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. Everyone's dealing with their own, you know, outside of the tea world, you know, life and things as well. And it's just so fascinating to see all these threads kind of having their own timelines. And then, you know, I'm so interested to see how, the story comes together, you know, mm -hmm. how, how, uh, two, three, 10 years ne from now, we'll all look back at this time. And I believe say, you know, be able to say like this, there was some kind of turning point that really happened here during 2020, where we all started kind of seeing each other a little bit more and, 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 and congealing in these ways. Oh, yes, I agree wholeheartedly and what's interesting about that dynamic is the fact that um the fact that we are home and that in order for us to support each other um we actually have in order for us to be responsible to each other uh we actually need to use the technology that once separated us from physically interacting and that dynamic is helping us to take uh, charge of our relationships with people and there is a, a sense of accountability that we have through wearing masks through um being connected to the internet but realizing that it's unhealthy to utilize it for long periods of time just l looking at things that once separated us from a sense of connectivity by looking at instagram and focusing on comparisons to each other's lives based on curated moments and then allowing that to be what we imagined each other through that specific lens. When in re reality now we're, you know, we're, we're all home, it's re turned everything to center and we're starting to see um, just regardless of where we are, regardless of how much money we have, regardless of a lifestyle that we may live, we all need each other. We all need to encourage each other and we all are humanized um, once again so it's been a great um a balancing act and a great um equalizing agent um ironically to return to the technology that once um isolated us absolutely this is so this is something that's so topical and festive right now in my circles because i don't know if you've seen it but recently a lot of my friends have been watching this um this documentary on netflix called the social dilemma um I haven't yet, but I, 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 and it's 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 made more interesting this this um, this documentary becoming something of a cultural phenomenon, you know, to not 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 necessarily to the degree that something like Tiger King maybe did, but um, it's it's certainly making the rounds of of several people. And my twin worked on it; they boomed uh, on that on that show, and right. so 
it's been cool to kind of see it, but they talk about this. I, I, I only watched half of it last night. And then fun, ironically enough, it was like, it's this whole movie where it's telling you like your phone is a, is a trap that's like made to like uh, the, these big social media companies are like intentionally um, trying to keep you as engaged as possible on those platforms and doing it, pulling out all the stops toward this bottom line of engagement and then, of course, I'm like watching this documentary on Netflix and just kind of having this messaging pushed into my face. And I'm like, oh, man, maybe I should like go do something else. <laughs> but like instead of paying Netflix for to just give me this line of, of, of messaging. But I really like um, what you're saying about how it's interesting, how we're kind of almost leaning in to the technology. Right. Like and we're, we're having to come face to face with it, you know, where I think that we've kind of been in this this phase for a little while now, I think, with regard to technology, where we know it's not necessarily good for us in, when used in these certain ways, when it's just the mindless doom scroll, you know, on mm -hmm. Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, just something to take you away from the feelings that start bubbling up when you're left alone with your thoughts or your, your, your self, your spirit, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh and and i think now with all this home time family time thinking thinking self time you know all of these things it's uh you you can only escape so much and and now i think we're kind of just being forced to meet these beasts kind of dead in the face to some degree and it is my hope that for a lot of people those those dragons aren't as scary as maybe they thought they were and they're able to kind of push through them and find connection in some of the ways that you know you and I have um I, I experienced a lot of fear around using these technologies you know I don't I'm someone who doesn't post on social media a whole lot you know I really don't use it a lot for that reason that I think it's just kind of I had this vague sense that it's bad for me you know or that I'm, I'm giving my power over to something that is ultimately using it for things that don't align with my values. Right. And yet this year, I find that the overwhelming majority of my online time is spent on Zooms with the people I hold dear and, and want to continue to connect with and am connecting with through this um, platform. I'm, you know, using newer tech like Topia to hang out with people in a time frame where I can't go and hang out with them in a physical environment and, and becoming closer with those who are farther away, who in whom in the past I might've let just kind of fall off of my social radar, but now are remaining much more in my purview, yourself included, seeing as how you live very far from me, um, you know, and all of these things, you know, I, I'm spending time on lives, interacting with all the tea community, you know, no, you're right. That's exactly right. I, everything that you said, I think um, I, um, not to uh, I'll interrupt you, uh, but uh, Go ahead. But it seems as though that uh, my connection to social media or what I would hear most from other people pre-pandemic was, how do you always post all the time? How do you always uh, make the time to respond to all these comments? And how do you, um, he said, you always have such informative posts. And, and I realized after stepping back from that approach, well, I, I, part of me is, the, is of the academic mindset, wanting to inform, wanting to, um, wanting to share what I've learned. And in the process of that, I realized how unhappy I was um, doing all of that through a screen and that mm -hmm. the connection and the sense of um, accountability to myself was being lost uh, because I was curating aspects of my life but not directly integrating who I was growing as a person through learning about tea and I suddenly realized that now I'd created this persona that wasn't entirely aligned with who I was becoming through a tea I was the ceramicist who wanted to make work and all that is a part of me, I realized that um, there's much more that needed to be conveyed. And so the solution to that was taking the time between posts and taking a step back. Um, and I couldn't find the time to do that initially once the pandemic started because 
um, I, I felt like I had an obligation to continue to, to feed this beast, you know, that was part of my identity. And a lot of that was, it was a reward. You know, I received these psychological uh, rewards to continue doing so and to engage. But it's really interesting that the pandemic gave birth to eventually the uh, BLM movement. Mm. And all of a sudden, what really became important came right to the forefront. And what we posted became so much more, um, so, so much more about people, so much more about understanding each other and helping um, us to come to terms with our past and how that will affect our future and how we can better understand each other. And with that, I stopped posting because I wanted to give the stage to those who needed to convey the message and also share what I could as well. Um, but it wasn't about just tea anymore for about a month long period. It was about understanding the societal um, and, and the social uh, mores that we were uh, navigating in June and July mm -hmm. in, in, into August, especially um, with regards to the protests and understanding both the positives and the negatives and the nuances of understanding how groups are feeling misrepresented all of those unique um, avenues um, actually caused me to pause before posting. And I posted instead um, the lessons I was learning and the T then integrated into who I was becoming as a person through the philosophical understanding of what T really at its core does. And that's connecting people, helping us to see the humanity and for it to not simply be about tasting notes and being this elevated academic, which is also, you know, we've earned that, you know, that's an important part of understanding tea, helping people to buy better tea. But it, what, how is it really aiding us um, as a culture? How is it helping us to better understand each other and not just isolate ourselves because of that uh, uh, knowledge? So overall, um, I started posting maybe once every two weeks once every you know like maybe two or three times a month and because of that my posts felt much more connected to myself and i felt like i could engage with people in more meaningful ways through zoom you know through instagram lives um and also my neighbors i was talking with them more often mm. and in small ways technology and conversation became more more important and i even heard my neighbor saying our boss is really like this whole working from home thing and after the pandemic they're actually going to do part-time uh, working at home remotely and then part-time working at at the office because they like how it's helping them to engage with their families and they're just as effective being at work um at home mm -hmm. um you know when, when when they take that time and they enjoy that dynamic. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, on that front, as far as the, the kind of, um, the changes in work culture that have kind of been brought to the forefront because of the nature of the pandemic, having like long lasting positive impact on how we, how we talk about work. But there's, there's so much in, in all of you, just all of what you just said that I want to unpack because there's, there's just so much good stuff there. Um, first, I think to take it kind of chronologically, if I can, through what you, what you were talking about, the first mm -hmm. part you, you started mentioning was um, where you were at kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, where you were posting very prolifically. Um, and, and from this kind of, um, you know, uh, this space of, uh, that, that is um, kind of, uh, tied in with academia, the kind of publish or perish kind of um, paradigm, but like also, uh, you know, you're you're that's something that you were contributing to the world even before the pandemic as as a teacher at a university, right? Like this is this is this is your wheelhouse very much so. And I have to say, just up front, I super super appreciated all of those posts so much. Like really, to me, you 
through all of those tasting notes and, the, and the, the dedication and the diligence with which you came at that, you're really writing the book, you know, in, in, in such a way about Gong Fu Chan Chinese tea and, and how giving people a model for this culture of appreciation and connoisseurship in, in, the, in the world of tea. And I think, um, you know, we'll get into in just a second, you know, how, how overposting and how this can come from a place of like, you know, triggering dopamine from all of the like, I'm, I'm doing something positive for the community and stuff. Um, we can get all into all of that for a, a second, but, you know, beyond those in, independent little moments, I think there is something to be said about if you're contributing regularly to something that you're passionate about, then you're adding to the net that people can latch on to, you know, people, people notice this thing, Gong Fu Cha and, and Chinese tea, people notice it and, and it provides a lot for a lot of people. Anyone who's served Gong Fu Cha to someone else and seen their face like light up and be like, oh, this is a thing that I could do for a while, you know, like um, knows what I'm talking about here. And, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this a number of times, but um, you know, it's, it's like all of that contribution um, at, uh, that you were putting in really does help make that island bigger, you know, that uh, the island of Gong Fu Cha is, is bigger and, and more able to catch people as they're kind of falling through the free space of, of, of the internet. Um, so there's that element to it. I want to say that that, that was, I, I definitely viewed that as a very positive experience, but to keep going further into what you were saying and how this kind of morphed over the course of the year where other things, as we start to have to reckon with our demons as, as a country, you know, we were talking a moment ago about how with all this home time, things start bubbling up. You can only avoid it so long. And, um, no surprise that we immediately start reckoning with some of our darkest shadow um, moments or, 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 you know, shadow sides that we're still very much trying to process as a country, um, which is, uh, you know, racial and, and wealth inequality, you know, class inequality, um, and, and the racial side of that be, and, and marginalization of people in general, not just from race, but from several angles, you know, um, gender, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're having to reckon with that right now, very much so. And so the transition into this place of, well, I, I want as, as a person contributing to the information set that is publicly available, I want to, I want to, I want to feed into this. I want to like um, lift up voices that I think are, are important in this space and, 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 and changing how, how you kind of use these technologies to enact some sort of community involvement. And I think that's kind of the ultimate place that I'm looking to come to on this um, front with, with regard to this kind of timeline that you laid out, which is this kernel, which is a feeling of involvement in your communities at various scales, right? So we have the country scale, we have the local scale, like you were talking about with your neighbors, you know, you have organizations or, or uh, subcultures like the Gong Fu Cha subculture that you people, people can be involved in. And there's tons of these all over the place. There's tons of these cultures and subcultures and, and different groups and organizations. People are, 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 you know, are meant to do this. Like we, we do this just without even trying you know, we, we, we form these, um, these groups and organizations and, 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 and we're social animals, you know? Um, and so, you know, I think one thing that you touched on that I, in, 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 in talking about this, I, I can kind of open up a little bit about wh why I was late today, which, um, gets down to, you know, I feel like I've learned so much this year about what, it means and what it takes to be involved actively in a community. And, and this, this is coming from somebody who community is, has always been a backbone element of my social life. I, in, in all that I've done as a, as a, as an adult, 
you know, where I have control over what I spend my time over, so much of that time has been spent building communities, whether it was the film community, the tea community, the other communities I'm involved in, arts communities in Austin, um, communities of, of, of people in Austin in general, or people in Chicago or Los Angeles or the other places that I spend my time. Um, community has always uh, formed a strong backbone of that. But at the same time, this year, I feel like I've learned so, so much just by being so actively involved in the cultures and subcultures and groups that I'm involved in. And today, one of the things we were talking about, so this, this regards West China Tea and this tea organization that has kind of built up this year specifically. It's, it's, it, it, it started kind of a new life cycle. Um, the tea scene in Austin has gone through several more metamorphosis periods, you know, where we go into a little chrysalis for a moment and then we come back out as like an even more beautiful butterfly or something. And this has happened a few times in the last 10 years in Austin. But uh, we began another one of these phases here in Austin at the beginning of the year with the closing of Guan Yin and the kind of emergence of West China Tea as its own individual entity beyond just it being an import company. It's now the focal point of the tea community in Austin and, and this kind of um, this effort that a bunch of um, kind of the diehards within that organization really, we saw an opportunity to turn it into something much greater right at the beginning of this year. And there were old guard people involved in that. There were several new faces who had kind of very recently taken on very deep entrenched roles in this organization. And one thing that we ended up talking about a lot today, um, so we had every Friday we have uh, our pulse meetings and these are like meetings where we kind of go over the week, how did we do? Did we do all of the tasks that we set out to do this week? Where are we at on all of the, 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 the goals we're trying to meet and, and, and kind of running the numbers and, and, and assessing ourselves? This is something we do every Friday morning at 11. And after that meeting, I ended up having a kind of post meeting with several of the members in this pulse, in, in, this, in this kind of leadership circle. Mm -hmm. um, and really dove into the deep end of, all right, we're at this point now in the organization's life where what is becoming the most important for this organization moving forward is this very strong feeling of connection to the, the central organism of this, this kind of megazord that we're trying to form with all of our individual pieces, um, we, what's becoming most important is how much each of us feels connected and motivated to stay connected to the Megazord. And that inherently brings up all of these conflicts, you know, the, these, these different things that need to be processed for that Megazord to stay together. And not the least of which is how to rewrite or edit the history of this organization and its, its nested place within all of the subcultures and cultures that it belongs to, you know, everything from its place in the Gong Fu Chak culture, its place in the Austin Tea culture, its place in each of our individual lives, its place on much broader humanitarian scales of like, you know, this is a, a movement toward bringing people together, all of these things. How do we rewrite and edit into the current time period such that it includes everyone's contribution at different times, acknowledges those contributions, and seeks to find ways to, to deepen that connection so as to move forward with it into a place where we can move as, as a unit and as this, and as this thing that really feels together, you know, um, because that's where we're looking to go. Right. And so a lot of things were brought up things about, you know, one person may have given a lot to the organization three or four years ago and then took a lot of time away from it. And some of the new folks never got to witness that stuff. Right. 
And so their perspective coming in is that they put in a lot at the beginning of this year. And now some of these old guard people who maybe put a lot in three or four years ago and are re-obtaining or reclaiming a position within the organization end up threatening some of these newcomers, you know, newer folks, newer faces, because those newer faces don't understand the contribution that they, they gave because they weren't around, you know, and, and, and all of this is to say that it does take a collaborative working effort to format that story that we're telling ourselves and using as a vehicle to fit ourselves into surrounding and in enveloping communities such that we all feel connected to this thing, connected to some kind of um, sense of belonging or a group. And then furthermore, that we are, we ourselves are providing meaning into that and getting something out of it. Right. So that's a lot to, all, all, a lot to, to take in, but you know, um, yeah, these, these are kind of the feelings that were going around today. And so I, I'd love to bounce them off you and just get your takes on all of these things. I would love that. And, uh, I, and, and really quick, what, uh, what I picked up from all of that, also having led several tea workshops and uh, small little collectives that, that uh, were born from the tea sessions that um, I would run with Dwayne Stackey, who's a local um, potter here in um, Oregon. And we would have these tea meetings at the Oregon College of Art and Craft and people started coming from all over Beaverton and the surrounding areas around Portland to have tea. Um, you know, things would spread through word of mouth, through us, uh, social media. And what I really realized was at the core of this was communication, is that it was a space where people felt free to discuss what was on their mind and how they could, and how they could actually, um, they could actually give of themselves to the collective and when one of them felt that something wasn't working they felt comfortable in indicating that and so just as you were indicating as you said there are some um, who have been around for a long time and you know obviously working at the same pace constantly had takes a toll so it's important to work in stratified layers and uh, tea ultimately by nature helps you to adjust you still work hard and you still do your best, but life, you know, ha has other plans. You start to have a family or you start to, you know, or like your parents get sick and you need to take care of them. There's numerous things that appear in life that are in many ways outside of our hands or are a product of just being involved in things outside of tea. So the best thing about that is tea helps us to communicate. It helps us to communicate what's wrong and what and uh, helps us to understand each other so everything that you said there we experienced the same thing here in oregon and other tea groups began because of that and as much as you know i may have been the one who initially introduced it i really realized that it was out of my hands i kind of you know i was almost like um sending a child out into the world that i may have you know helped people to see the nuances initially but what but when they began their own tea groups, their own small little collectives in Canada or uh, in California or even here in Oregon, they um, just birthed the collective um, energies that were, were needed. And um, it created a space for people to talk about things. And, as, and because of that, other organizations were birthed and people were communicating. That was the main thing is, when something wasn't right or when something was working, that sense of thanks and accountability or a sense of being honest when things weren't, uh, were only strengthened. And so I think of everything that you said there, the main thing that it's attributing to is a sense of real communication uh, based on really listening to the people around you um, without obligation other than to um, other than realizing that we can't do this all by ourselves. We need each other and we burn out, you know, we're human beings, you know, we can only do so much as we get older, even, even though we're very healthy, we need to be accountable to ourselves, to our partners, you know, and 
And so that really, I feel that I really learned a lot about that this year in, mm -hmm. in, in T. All the lessons I had learned from the last four or five years came to fruition because of the time that we had this year. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 it, and, uh, and, as we as we kind of unpack this, I'm 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 seeing how broadly this applies. I think in uh, alongside your your focus on communication here, I will add that it is a focus on communication with with the openness, like you said, to 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 say when something isn't working, and and to deepen that, I will say it's it's with a a certain directionality toward connection where you know for for a very long time it seems we've we've kind of individually many people have individually been using their communication to position themselves in a certain way um, or to identify themselves in a certain way such so as to feel real like these are these are impulses that are coming from good places you know places of of wanting to fit in in the community but the way we were doing that was pushing us into a place of atomizing into these groups and maybe to some degree that's the you know we could attribute that to like facebook you know trying to sell us all ads or whatever but ultimately it ends up polarizing us right and when we take this other viewpoint of like this communication is driving toward a sense of connectivity and connection and like you said we all are in this together like we're, we need to come together you know, I start thinking about these concepts like I was talking about of, of like rewriting this story to include other people. I, I, I can say, you know, obviously I'm, I was definitely one of those millennials over the last 10 years saying, man, baby boomers really messed it all up for a lot of us and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, they, 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 you know, all this stuff that gets touted in numerous think pieces, you know, all over the place. But, you know, I think about it now and I'm sitting here like, you know, People of that age got us here. And so to some degree, you know, our, this, this line of ancestry has to be honored. You know, we have to find a way to rewrite the story such that we can mine it for the good that these older people were able to give us, you know, the, the good things, the ways they were able to move us forward in the culture and toward a, a, a better place now that we find ourselves in and to forgive them for the, the evil that has been wrought from whatever their, their decisions, you know, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to unwittingly bring some amount of, of, of negative consequence into this collective space through our actions. It's, it's un, it's, it's always going to happen. It's part of, it's part of trying is you have to fail, right? You have to try and fail to learn how to do it well, you know? And so in many ways, some of these things that, you know, when, when extrapolated to an nth degree or down a long timeline become really big problems, big systemic problems that just kind of go un, unprocessed for a really long time. Sometimes, I tend to think, or really almost all the time, I tend to think it's much more productive to try and process these things together with each other and with ourselves than mm. it is to try and point blame, which maybe is something that we're learning in this time frame because we have, you know, a, a leader in America, at least, who really loves making, pointing fingers and, and placing blame. Really, our whole system does that. You know, it, it puts the blame on, on somebody else instead of... Uh, <laughs> saying, you know, when I see some kind of uh, outrageous headline, you know, in, in the news, it seems like it's almost crafted toward uh, this thing of like, oh, yeah, this gets me so mad. And it's these other people's fault. And I'm just going to get madder at them instead of, you know, oh, man, there's a problem out there. We, we need to do something about it. And, and that is much more important than whose fault it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. No, that's, in the end, the nuances of what you're discussing and what you're talking about is when we, is uh, this system that we're a part of is, um, has been, has, uh, may have had, Again, as with anything, as you said, with the previous generation, 
with the uh, baby boomers, they made lots of mistakes. But because of that, they learned a great deal. And there were many advances that we can be thankful for because they took the time to try to understand um, how to pull grains of hope out of things. And just as we're learning through BLM and, you know, through the LGBTQA discussions pertaining to understanding the nuances of what is it that makes us human? What is it that helps us to understand um, without, without pushing things aside um, as a way to elevate ourselves? It actually stops culture from growing. You think about um, ancient cultures like Rome or Babylon and things of that sort and um, building a sustainable culture means breaking down elements of things that don't work either. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to honor, you have to honor the perspectives of those that came before, because guess what? We are going to be the next, you know, we're on our way to being, you know, the, the, the older ones of the um, generation in just a few decades here. So, and then we're the ones saying, oh my goodness, what, what was, I can't believe I allowed myself to, you know, to stop the discussion. I actually, I actually, um, I actually was part of the problem in this instance by wanting to say, you know, we, by attacking each other and that ultimately, um, that, that didn't lead to a discussion. And in the end, this system, different systems collapsed because there wasn't a sense of, because uh, the, the discussion ended. Mm. So, so uh, as you said, with regards to social media and, you know, our, our leaders now, um, I think now that we have the time to digest what's occurring, you know, we're realizing that anger by itself, even socially driven, you know, like social justice, a sense of righteous justice can only take us so far if we're not talking about it. Mm -hmm. And if we're not actively helping to still understand where each of us are coming from, because then we're still thinking selfishly, we're still thinking about ourselves. And then, and we're not taking the time to digest how that is facilitating the conversation. Instead, sure. we're just acting. And when you just act, there's no sense of reflection. There's no sense of appreciation. But when the time is right, we take action, but we're doing it as a collective now instead of just trying to do it ourselves, being the lone wolf. And okay. while that may work, and while we obviously have the, the heroes historically who changed an, an, entire, an entire culture because of the actions they took, most of the time the ones that we remembered were the ones who listened to the individuals and would work with them. You didn't see it when you know, they were touted and raised up. But what you didn't see behind the scenes is they were actively working and talking with people and helping to understand things. And that's the one thing I'm starting to wonder about is like, um, we enjoy seeing things. We enjoy seeing the nuances of the person who lifted everyone out. We've got superheroes like Batman and Superman and things of that sort. And really that's just a call to mythology. We love to mythologize certain people and and they become the collective um, go-to when it comes to understanding an, an ideal. And we still do that to this day. But at the same time, the point being, um, we're, taking, we're now learning to step back with social media. We're more connected now than we ever have been. Mm -hmm. We now I have uh, the ability to see each other and uh, we can advocate for things that were far beyond us previously to convey all at once. And we can look back on it and we can reflect on it. And so we're focusing less on the hero worship and more on communicating how we all ultimately are, um, we as a whole um, uh, are really leading to that change. It's not about the elevated person. It's about the, it's about the conscious people. And sure. slowly but surely starting to see, um, you know, a sense of accountability in the collective as opposed to just, um, and because we're doing that, we're able to look at ourselves in the mirror and better understand ourselves. Absolutely. And yeah, so that's what I'm starting to see is that we, we now look to ourselves because uh, we're better seeing how 
we affect the collective. Totally. Well, and a few things on that. So one, in, in reference to this kind of like great person mentality that we are, are very attracted to, I think, in Western culture, at least. Um, this is something that we, we're constantly lifting up individuals um, and saying, this was a great person. They, this person brought us into the new age or whatever. Um, you know, to, to kind of make a direct link, we could say somebody like Martin Luther King, right? We lift this person up as somebody who made, to, helped the country take great leaps forward um, culturally. But we rarely think about all of the people that were involved in that same organization that themselves lifted someone like Martin Luther King up to the forefront, specifically because he was particularly able to talk to people you know, in a really good way. And that was only one of a slew of necessary roles in that community that made it a strong community during the 1960s, right? Um, and I think some people now are beginning to learn this the hard way, right? Like through direct experience, through the fact that you can become an incredibly um, well-known and, and widely published speaking voice very quickly through social media. Mm -hmm. There have been countless figures within the Black Lives Matter movement in mm -hmm. the last several years who have become overnight famous from their uh, success at communicating to the broader public. But we learn very quickly that speaking to the broad public is only one part of the equation because here we are several years down the road since Black Lives Matter got off the ground and we still haven't met a lot of the goals of that, um, of that organization. We're just now starting to get some of that uh, traction this year with things like defund the police um, and, 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 and stuff like that. You know, these are some big strides that are happening and it's happening not because one person got successfully shouted into a megaphone, but because these people all re are be have begun to recognize we're in this together and we want to see this real change happening. And over the years, quietly, without any reverence at all or spectacle, people have started to find their role within those mechanisms and to contribute little things all in tandem such that the actual successful uh, steps forward can happen. That's you know, and I think in no small part, those, those small steps have been accelerated this year because of the fact that, you know, we have this space to do that. You know, before 2020, so many of us were just hurtling through time on a sense of inertia you know there's just you have to go to work every every week and 40 hours a week is spent just at work and and staying alive and isn't it crazy that rents go up every year and 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 my job that i still do is just becoming less and less valuable even though like and i'm having to work more and more and more and spend less and less of my time thinking about the stuff that we really need to change and, and having this time and space to process these systemic problems that we're trying to process. And what a beautiful thing that we have all of this time and space this year. Obviously it comes with its dark side, you know, it's, 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 it's fueled by misery and, and, and hardship and death and, 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 and very strong amounts of grief and difficulty for a lot of people. Um, and that can't be discounted, but, you know, it's also giving us this space to process these things. And, and one might see this as, as, a, as the earth as a living organism in, in its entirety. We're actually processing these things now. And so it's, it's no surprise we find ourselves in this kind of a situation here in 2020, you know. Um, I yeah. A whole, a wholeheartedly. And that that point that you made that it's through great um, difficulty. It's through, um, you know, that it's when, when we are cosseted, we become um, anxious. 
we become anxious because uh, it's the difficulties, it's the balance between being conscious of the need for change in conjunction with the balance for the need for peace. But yeah. also, more importantly, um, it's knowing that we're strong enough to come through on the other end, having learned something that actually shows a, a marked change in our world that helps us to keep moving forward. And when we can do that as a collective, when we do that as a group, is um, and the fact that we're not trying to force, um, when it's not based on forcing, but rather trying to understand what the problem is, mm. Small, those small details, as you said, those small um, movements by everyone knowing how they fit into the equation. We're not trying to fit them into a mold. We're saying, what is it that you really care about? And it could be, and obviously that doesn't happen immediately. I can honestly say that my, that I'm still learning how I fit into that equation and it changes every year. But the fact that I'm learning about it and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and uh, having these difficult discussions, I'm learning my place in how I can give m my best, how I can give my best and understand collectively where everyone is on that front. And, mm. and so mm. I agree with you that it's about small, small movements done as a whole, drastically builds momentum for what we would refer to as real change, but all it really is, is we're opening discussions so that we can process, so that we right. can really process what is happening around us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and this, this brings up something really interesting, kind of what you were saying reminded me of, you know, in contrast to the, the attraction toward great humans, individual humans, that we, we talked about how we, how we like to lift them up. An example of another time when, um, a collective really came together and made really, really big change happen because the collective came together. An example of this would be um, during the Second World War and the amount to which American culture really congealed around the war effort. Um, but in contrast, like you were saying, that was one that in many cases was fueled by this kind of forcing um, mentality you know it's it's your duty to do this and you have to do this even if you don't like it because you know it's the 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 collective is more important and all of these things and that had its own consequences right of of that kind of a shape for forcing collective action while while we reaped great benefits i think um in some cases from that sort of collective action it is it is worth noting how different the kind of collective action we're able to take now um, with the space to talk about, well, like where exactly do I fit in here? And, and how, how can I really contribute to this thing? It's a much larger landscape and it's not being fueled by this, you know, um, it's not being fueled by a conformity mindset. It's not, we all need to come together around this one thing. And if you're not contributing to this one thing, you're not doing it right. You're not doing your duty or whatever. It's not forcing collective action in that way, though there are many forces trying to do that. You know, there's no, no shortage of, you know, people eating each other up on, on Twitter because they're not, you know, uh, they're virtue signaling and they're not, you know, doing it right or whatever. There's people pouncing on each other left and right. But it, it's, it's through viewing this and feeling all the feelings that go along with how bad that feels, you know, trying to find your place in the world and having people tell you you're not doing it right because you're not aligning with, you know, this set down set of core values that go along with this movement or this organization or this um, identity complex, you know, or whatever. Um, we're starting to pick some of those things apart and, and give ourselves a little bit more flexibility um, to congeal around not just conformity as unity through this sense of conformity and coming together and, and finding a single common thread, but through this ability to recognize differences and through this kind of multiplicity um, and that's, I think, one of the, the most special places where T is able to kind of fit into the, to the equation, right? Because it really does position its, uh, the culture 
um, really celebrates this idea of bringing people together from very different points of view and saying that's a good thing. Like, oh, our organization, our collection, our, 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 our like, our, 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 our community is stronger for having these various points of view, skill sets, different things that people can bring to the table. And lo and behold, we're finding, you know, that people like that. People like having a specific identity within this community and it not being the same as somebody else's identity within the community, you know? Finding meaning means finding these individual spaces where people can thrive within a community, but that ultimately contribute to this thing that we're all connected to so that we feel like a larger organism, you know? And that's a really special thing, I think, that, that you know, was again made possible by those who came before us who weren't able to do this in this, in this nice of a way. Um, not to say this is not, I mean, obviously it sucks in a lot of ways and it's, it's painful, but it's, it's different than it was before. No, well, as you said, we're hoping that each generation, I think it's almost inevitable for us to learn from the previous generation and, uh, and it, it, it really does take time. And, uh, it seems as though, um, and I recall this, um, from several texts about the psychology of war. It specifically indicate. I mean, I've seen it run like a red thread throughout all of these texts from the last like 100 years pertaining to the fact that uh, war, uh, the longer the period of war, uh, the longer the period of peace that wants to persist. Mm -hmm. And so that to me indicates that, um, that even though advances come during wartime, even though unique uh, mindsets emerge, scientists come to important collectives, uh, collective understanding about the human race. There is always going to be people who um, I think internally, almost subconsciously, and even genetically, um, we actually feel within ourselves, carrying it from generation to generation, what didn't work. And mm -hmm. obviously there are unique, there are unique avenues tied to say, uh, neo uh, um, Nazism because of people being stuck inside of a bubble. They weren't allowed to see other people's perspectives or it was, or it was, um, or it was, um, they were uh, um, denigrated to, you know, that if they ever tried to see other perspectives, then they wouldn't, you know, then, then uh, they were betraying their, their, um, uh, their uh, culture and in the process of doing that they weren't able to learn about themselves and um and i think because of that um they are drawn to the idea of better understanding other people once they are allowed to exit that this can be applied to people who go to college people who go to university or people who travel or backpack through a uh, europe there's a sense of wanting to connect, wanting to communicate. And, um, and the ones who, who don't get that opportunity at times, um, you know, that is ge that genetic specificity is, it's not lost, but it's, but it's buried. It's buried. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all of us see this and we, and we notice the, the nuances of it, um, I think, as we grow older. And as we start to understand, and again, social media has increased this tenfold because now we're seeing uh, nuanced behaviors in ways that we couldn't before. So it's intensified our sense of understanding the world around us. A lot of it is curated, but at the same time, um, I mean, we could delve into that you know, on several forms, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, the main point being that. Um, uh, like my going to China and seeing how tea is utilized there and how the Tao is implemented in a sense of just to live life, just to understand and to pay respect to the world around you and to better understand. You start to see connective threads across, mm -hmm. across, the, hum across the human perspective and what people crave. And so, and, uh, 
And that's made very difficult, I think, for Americans because a uh, there's a lot of messaging that says stay here, never leave here, you know, don't go anywhere else because we have it better than anywhere else. And don't you, if you don't see that, then you're you're you know you're blind or whatever. Um, but there's so much to be gained from going to other countries. So I, this this actually does segue into one of the things that I really wanted to ask you um, and have you kind of go through, walk me through, um, is your, your adventures in China. Um, you know, I think that's something that I'm, I'm definitely wanting to explore a lot with some of the folks in this space who have gotten the opportunity to go to another country, specifically China. And, um, especially now as tensions between our two cultures kind of ratchet up in, in one way or another, as we, as we meet the fact that, you know, they're both very powerful. Um, I'm really interested in your perspectives on what going to China did for you, how, how, how you moved through that country and, and, and what your impressions were um, and, and what you kind of gleaned from those experiences. Oh, yes. And de depending on the subject, um, I think I learned more in my last four years uh, three or so years of going back and forth to China several times, then I probably, I felt like I lived a few lifetimes because of just the sheer magnitude of voices I listened to and understanding that I gained of people. Um, not so much that it was I who was gaining it, but the fact that um, I got to see how people lived, how people, um, you know, navigated their space religiously, spiritually, I mean, um, just through everyday work and their opinions on people and um, just the nuances of several factors. But, um, added, but uh, I think that my first time going to China, I was going specifically uh, because a potter and, and, and I had a discussion about tea and about the fact that I, at that point I'd been learning about tea for roughly about uh, almost a year. It was 2000, uh, it was 2016 or so. And then it was, um, and so really I haven't been studying tea all that long. It's been about four years. Hmm. And, uh, but at the same time, I delved into it very, very hard. Once I started to see the nuances of the community here in, here in Portland, and then I started realizing, oh my goodness, this mentor has been to India, this mentor has been to Africa, this mentor has been to, and you know, to several spots. And overall, my wanting to go to China was a sense, um, wanting to find, I think initially wanting to find, a lot of people say find yourself, but it wasn't so much a finding of the self as much as it was finding out what I wasn't. So I was trying to let go of what I had become that wasn't working so that I could find out the essence of who I was. Mm. And so it was a shedding off of things that weren't, that didn't allow me to, um, to pay attention and to discuss and to understand other people. I was actually letting go of that previous self that wasn't working the part of me, whether you want to refer to it as a capitalist understanding, it's more than that. It's much deeper. It goes deeper than just one mentality. It's several factors. Um, and again, those things weren't bad in and of themselves. They're meant to maintain a culture, to maintain um, a society. But then when you start to let, when you start to see through the nuances of what they're doing, you start to see what isn't working and what needs to shift and not violently, but do it through communication, through understanding. Um, I learned by just sitting with the Dai Potters and Hishwan Bana and hitting with you and Sohan and hitting with uh, several members of the Tief family that I'm still in touch with um, via WeChat kind of um, our, obviously for those who don't know the, the, the um, it's essentially inst, Instagram and, um, you know, kind of our Instagram, Facebook, PayPal, it's all of our applications mixed into one. Um, and, uh, oh, it just started raining really heavily. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Oh my gosh. This, 
makes me so happy. Um, whoever is uh, hearing this, we have had really bad fires this time of, of year, the worst in our history. And this is literally going to make, oh, we're going to have a good week weekend on a lot of people can have some hope so oh, oh, that may be right. very good oh that's so good to hear my friend that's so, yeah. so very nice but um to kind of uh delve back into that um it seems as though spending time with the die potters and seeing how they integrated appreciation um they were still working very hard they had that hard working mentality when we think of people in um, China, there is a little bit of truth to what has delved into our mentality of different cultures, but the stereotype d doesn't completely serve the whole person, you know? And so what we didn't know and what a lot of people don't realize about people in China, obviously, is the balance between um, understanding the emotionality, our emotional selves, and understanding what we need in order to take breaks, in order for us to, um, almost like the year, we may think of the European perspective, the French perspective of like fully enjoying a meal, you know, and taking time to rest, or in Spain, enjoying the si siesta in the middle of the day and taking a break from work. You know, a lot of us in America, we, we think of that as almost um, a negative quality if we're looking from a purist perspective pertaining to what we've been trained from youth and in and of itself that has its place too because you know we don't want to be uh, when we become lazy we we lose ourselves too so it's finding a balance between those points um, traveling i got to see the way that people were listening to what they needed and culturally they took the time to um you know to to converse and to learn from each other and to let themselves rest so that they can be more effective. And that's what I mean by shedding off the layers that, um, that weren't needed and you were leaving behind gaining that and you were learning to become the essence, you know, uh, you, know you at your core, um, who, you were, who you want to really be. So what I'm trying to say specifically is the die people would take time while they were working very hard making pots to have tea. When they could tell they were getting tired, they would sit down at the tea table and they would just enjoy their tea. They, and then they would take turns to serve each other tea. And when someone was sick, they would wear a mask. And I saw like little tiny things um, that indicated that they understood that by aiding each other, um, they were actually helping themselves too. Cause then we, weren't harboring this. I mean, obviously there were still problems because it, it inherently um, communication is still a challenge at times, but, um, but I just noticed that it was, it was intuitive. They took the time to really listen to, to their bodies and to converse with each other and whether or not it was just about, you know, like um, life that day or how hard everything was they weren't afraid to talk about tough things things that needed to be dealt with and because of that and because people weren't necessarily throwing shade at them every single time um or you know um i saw there was a sense of appreciation of learning to learning to rest learning to um learning to slow down learning to slow down so that when you do get back to work, you can be more attentive. And that's something that I, that I did not see in our current world here in the United States, or at least not um, in the way that we had been trained. And again, it's because in many ways, obviously we balance each other out. When we go to other parts of the world, we see what doesn't work and we see what does work and we balance the scales. That's the strength in the international perspective is understanding that, that individually as a society, um, things may not work. But when we combine the collective elements from other societies, we suddenly go, okay, how is this helping me to reach the essence of what's really working, of what's really working? You know, we stop thinking only individually, right. you know? And so that's what I started to see was um, 
how have I learned to shed off the old personality and put on the new one, if you will? Mm -hmm. And so this trip to Xishuang Bana, was that your first time in China? That was my first time. That was December 2017. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so our, our, our time together was also your, your first time in China. Since then, you've been back yes. a few times. Can you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about like what those journeys were like and, and how that kind of played out over the last few years? Yes, so since that time, um, I met other colleagues there, and he's from Bana and other academics, and uh, from Korea, from Japan, from Malaysia, you know, people from all over Asia, and also from uh, Europe, you know, through, um, you know, through, uh, they were in Belgium, they were in Delft, you know, I mean, just places all across, um, you know, the Norwegian um, um, area, also from uh, from Spain. I mean, just numerous lo locations, and they invited me to go um, to to live with them and for me. And we, we would make work, and then I would essentially help to teach specific techniques and things of that sort, and uh, through grants and things of that sort, I could actually go and ha and um, get assistance with airfare and um, living expenses and things of that sort. And so my second time back to China uh, was, I went to, I'm trying to remember now because I've been back several times. It was Jingdezhen, which is one of the porcelain capitals of um, Asia. And it's interesting because I used to say Jingdezhen was the porcelain capital of all of China. And in reality, Dehua is another porcelain capital and Japan even has like porcelain collectives and things of that sort. And they all think of themselves as the core. And I started noticing that really they all are leading to the collective um, avenue across uh, uh, porcelain within China. And uh, if anyone wants to learn more about that, there's a book called The Hair with um, Amber Eyes. That's a really great book um, about individuals who are kind of um accessing that space and learning about it but um all but there's a book ironically now in our current time period called the white road um that deals with porcelain within asia and how it's affected europe and the united states so uh, if you want to look into that uh, those books are are high recommendations for understanding the historical perspective but i went to uh, jingdezhen and my purpose there was to give a, a lecture on my life and experiences as an American potter in uh, gaining an American um, education within the ceramics community. So um, earning my uh, a master's. So I essentially gave my master's a dissertation in China with the help of a translator. Mm. And so that was a very unique opportunity for us to have a cross-cultural blending of um, elements and for us to have a discussion and that was very transformative for me as well because we had people from all all over asia there all over europe again and because of that trip i was able to go back to china a third time with a completely different group every time i go back to china it's always with a different group than the one i was just invited you know by you know so that's the thing is there's a sense of wanting to connect to each other. Um, so that way, China just seems to understand that by communicating through the arts, we actually all grow. So the arts kind of have, are acting as that, uh, as that collective space where we all can put things aside for just a bit and understand how we can culturally better understand each other. And uh, it just seems to me that the arts have serve that collective good over the course of many hundreds, if not thousands of years uh, through um, creating, through architecture, through um, cultural understanding, through um, paintings, ceramics, all those things. And uh, China um, and the universities are noticing that. So that was my experience in Jingdezhen was giving the lecture, giving demonstrations within pottery. And my experience there um, was by far 
the most connected that I had had within the academic sphere, not just with individuals, but with people within academics. And um, I'm still unpacking that because there's a lot that occurred. And um, some of it was performative because we law uh, because we were, you know, we didn't have a lot of time. I was there in China for four days. It was not a long trip. I had to fly up, stayed there for three and a half days, and then I had to fly back mm -hmm. to the United States. So, but that trip showed the flexibility with which China invites people from other institutions, other backgrounds. Um, so it was really interesting that, um, that uh, that's where I, purchased a lot of teapots, purchased a lot of things to bring back to the tea club back at the school where I was um, teaching mm -hmm. at the Oregon College of Art and Craft and, um, and give those pieces as gifts and give um, lectures on all the different pieces and also during tea clubs explaining how they work and spread um, the Chinese understanding of Gong Fu Cha. Mm. And even when I was in Jingdejin and I was giving lectures about the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, and during the Song Dynasty, um, tea was um, elevated to an art form. And so that, so that specific art form um, ended up being, uh, oh, uh, ended up being uh, such a, um, so, oh, sorry, I was looking at the clock because I remembered that I made the session for three hours. And so it was one till three, so I got like an hour. So I'm just kind of keeping an eye on things. Cool. But um, so essentially, they wanted to hear what Americans thought about their culture, too, mm. and how we were perceiving it and how that reflection acted in helping them to better understand um, how their culture was translating. So that right there was a really big, that was a very humbling moment for me, realizing that they wanted to hear outside perspectives about their own culture. And that, um, quite honestly, just um, it, 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 uh, it facilitated what was already happening within me, mm -hmm. which is the sense that, you know, we are, you know, we really should be questioning ourselves mm -hmm. and we should be really questioning what's happening in our cultures and trying to understand that instead of trying to say we're the best or this is the way it's supposed to be. It's not that China is necessarily doing this better than anyone else, but within ceramics, within academics, within art in and of itself, it's that lens of art. It allows us to step outside of the societal and the political norms and to look at the human perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's what I noticed through the arts um, that yeah. those things were um, um, happening. I think that's some, one of the reasons that I, I, I feel drawn to the arts so often is that it does kind of sidestep this sort of mainstream story that we end up getting when we try to understand something as complex as another country, specifically one that's as big geographically as the United States with five times as many people, um, you know, and, and, and massively older as a country, you know. Um, in reckoning with something like that, you know, the political, the socio-political or like uh, geopolitical angle on that ends up being so reductive, right? Where we, we become so focused on this kind of strategy mind with regard to either our own safety as a country or our, our geopolitical position and, and how that stacks up in an almost sports-esque kind of competition space. Um, and all of that is so distracting to me from so much of the gold and platinum that can be mined from the interchange of our two cultures, you know? And I do feel like you're right, like the arts is a place where we've, you know, cultures have been able, within these contexts of the arts, cultures have been able to sidestep kind of what ends up being a little bit more of a mainstream um, uh, 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 story being told to people at large, uh, especially those who don't have the time or resources or desire to go and put themselves in that place, right? Like you were able to put yourself in China. And that, um, that's a really important thing. And one that I recommend to 
anybody who has the means or can find the means, you know, grants are a thing. And, and even if you don't have them right up front, there, there may be ways to do it. But, um, you know, that's such an important thing. But for those who don't, aren't able to do that, that sense of questioning ourselves and our visions of other cultures, what is it we're not seeing uh, about ourselves because we're not exposed to these other cultures? You know, what are we, what, what, what are we trapped in by only consuming American and English content, English language content in America? You know, um, what are we not seeing by not, by failing to expose ourselves to the thought processes that are coming out of Africa or coming out of South America or, you know, anywhere else? You know, it's so often that I find people have such contempt for a country like Russia, who unfortunately finds itself farther along a path socio-politically than we do in, in so far as the people of Russia are good people. Like Americans are good people. Like a lot of the time are very good people and want to live meaningful uh, and, and, and good lives but their, their governments are all we focus on, you know, their, their corrupt government and saying, you know, you and I experienced this um, to some degree in China. I remember um, some of the European folks who were traveling with us who were part of this coterie. Um, this was in 2017, the, the sting of the new administration of, that started in 2016, still pretty fresh, you know, and we, I personally, and, and I, 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 I imagine some of, to some degree, this was true for you as well, um, experienced some amount of prejudice from the European folks who wanted to conflate me as an American with this administration to say that we are one and the same, even though in America, we probably have one of the most robust um, uh, uh, or entrenched knowledge is that we are not our government and that our government is always contentious. Obviously, this has formed a suboptimal situation of like a two party system. And, you know, we're always taking sides. But at the very least, one would think as an American that most folks outside of America could see that not all Americans support the American administration. But, you know, for those who don't have the time or the desire to go and look into that in any more nuanced a form than what you immediately get through osmosis through your messaging channels, it's easy to see how one might conflate any given American with their organ with their their administration. And I think that's an important thing to realize as an American because then it allows us to look at other countries with the same through the same lens, to be able to look at the people of China or the people of Russia, um, countries that we sociopolitically consider enemies through the media, you know, are, are made to believe that these people are our enemies through the media. Um, and yet the things that we can mine through being exposed to those cultures, there's so much richness there. There's so much richness and the people are not their administration. You know, um, there, there's a great saying that comes out of China are you frozen? Shoot. Oops. Oh, there, there we go. You're back. Um, there's this, there's this great um, saying that uh, I, uh, we have that I learned in Chinese that we have um, Sohan has a teapot that has this on it. Um, and that's how I learned it. But it's a saying that comes from China. It says, Shan Gao Huang Di Yuan which means the mountain is high and the emperor is far away, which is to say I, somebody living in the mountains of Western China, for example, am not one and the same with the yellow emperor, you know, uh, am not the same as my administration. I can do something else if I want to. And I'm living my own life out, out here, regardless of what they say in Beijing, even though, that obviously has an effect on my life in one way or another. But, you know, I think we experience this kind of a privilege in America a lot, you know, where we, we can live our own lives and very much do live our own lives, regardless of what the administration does. 
They, their power over us is not all encompassing yet. And we, uh, we always have this opportunity to continue to tell that story when we tell the story of our country and its position in the world, you know? Um, yeah. No, I agree with that. And that's a beautiful thought because it's a reminder that even the emperor needs to be reminded from time mm -hmm. to time. Yeah. That this is, that there is, there are things outside of the administration. It's a reminder that, um, if we spend too much time cosseted within our own space, um, we start, you know, we, we long for comfort. We long for conformity if we, you know, and then in the process, it's no coincidence that our health starts to suffer. You know, our physically we start to break down emotionally. We become unhappy and there's a balance to be had b between helping us to understand that we crave understanding others. We crave realizing when things does, you know, when things don't work, mm -hmm. you know? And so why do we want to become our own individual person? And yet at the same time, when does that become a negative trait in helping us to become part of a collective? So it's about understanding the balance of the essence of the person, which um, is part of what, I was personally trying to seek when going to China each, each time and uh, just experiencing Asia mm -hmm. in, in general because Yunnan is such a wonderful place to delve into that because the Lansang Mekong River Basin uh, connects it to Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, and Cambodia. You're getting all these unique ethnic minority cultures that have come as a product of being able to sail across you're under, you know, I mean, it's one of those unique places that share so many cultural, culturally diverse norms. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's being in places where that diversity is present um, that, uh, and again, part of the thematic element of the tourist industry within that space, which has its positive and negative aspects, um, was, was, understanding the artistic application of all of these cultures. Mm -hmm. And that was celebrated in the festival that we were a part of. Mm -hmm. They were celebrating these um, uh, cultures and they were singing the songs of all of these unique cultures. And I still remember this very well as I remember hearing people when the, the uh, Laos songs would, would start, people would sing in Laos and then when you know, Cambodian or like any of the others, they started to sing along. And then when the Mandarin songs started, and then when the Dai song started, our colleagues would sing along. And it was a sense of everyone is singing each other's song. We're all kind of learning each other's cultures. And I remember getting a misty eyed because I was like, wow, this is something I, it was almost, um, it, it was a lot all at one time. It was a lot of all at one time, but uh, I always uh, realized that when it came to the tea culture, that that's what, uh, that is when people are given the space to experience that, you know, they don't forget it as much because it's affecting the heart. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it dives deep. Right, exactly. And, uh, and I, and on that note though, about better understanding, um, as you said, I was fascinated by the fact that a lot of the European people that we came into contact with, I mean, they had their own, um, to, to, to discuss the things that culturally um, separate us through mindset was what you were talking about pertaining to, um, you know, the stereotypes that we carry about each other's culture. And because I was approaching through the lens of tea, I, I had to work really hard that when I, when people would ask me my political p opinion about things, I wanted to listen to theirs as well. So that way we could actually have a dialogue. Cause by the time I was learning that the dialogue was more important than stating just an opinion, mm -hmm. so I was trying really hard to stay within that mindset. It wasn't always easy, but at the same time, um, and also I, I could tell when I was being too abrupt with my opinions because people's faces would just shift. Mm -hmm. And they would like go, whoa. And I was like, 
oh my goodness, this is no longer a dialogue. This is just me spouting my stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And I had to, and I realized that I need to step back. And that happened several times. And that was a lesson right there. Mm -hmm. Something that we all continually work on when it comes to being in other parts of the world that aren't our own. And uh, so hearing people from Europe say, like referring to this talented Taiwanese potter saying, oh, there's the, there, there's the Taiwanese boy, you know? And there was like a hint of that. And like, I was like, I know they're playing, but I could hear the hint of stereotype on it. And it, at the same time, nothing against them as humans other than we all have that to work on. Mm -hmm. you know, and that part of the reason why we travel is to work on those things. But, and also like when I was, when the Dyke people asked me to teach them uh, English, um, I spoke to a colleague that taught a uh, Mandarin and English, and she set me up with an entire um, lesson plan that I had to put together for later that evening. And um, the year, and uh, one of the European um, potters asked me, um, you know, can I sit in and help? And so, Whenever I was speaking, she, um, there were times when she would say, but that's not how we pronounce it in the UK. And that's the proper way. That's the English way. That's the way that, that's proper English. You shouldn't teach them American English. And that was a very interesting space to enter when the Dai people were like confused. They're like, which way do I learn? What's, you know, what's, mm -hmm. you know, that helped. That also was a space where I had to, um, that was usually the, the time when I had to either pour everyone a cup of tea because mm -hmm. we had our tea there and it broke everyone's, you know, everyone stopped for just a minute and they were like, Oh, I'm enjoying this nice warm tea. And what were we talking about again? It mm -hmm. really helps you to relax and digest what's occurring and saying, what's the important thing right now? we're learning English. Let's learn, let's learn English. And we can learn the American equivalent and the UK equivalent. We can learn both. We each take our turns, you know? And so not, you know, the American way is the only way or the UK way is, you know, the proper way. Right. You know? So it, it became, again, T became the a mediator whenever those problems occurred. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is a secret technique <laughs> that I can <laughs> utilize to kind of shift everyone's mindset. And uh, I, then I thought, oh, this is a powerful thing. And it made me so much more conscious of using it responsibly, using, yeah. you using it well. So that was, so on what you discussed, whenever a stereotype occurred, I would usually serve more tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a, a very useful technique. We've talked about that a lot um, in the tea house um, in, in, in over the years in, in previous tea houses and things as we've, we've often gotten together with folks who would pour for events at the tea house and had discussions about like, well, what happens if some kind of, if we notice some tension around the tea table and you can always bring it back to tea. That's one of the most beautiful things about tea is that it's this very great equalizer. Everyone's still drinking the tea. You know, that's, that's something that by design of being around a tea table, we set that up as the foundation so that when we get start vibrating at higher levels and and start to feel some tension we can just bring it right back down return to our foundation and be like all right we're still drinking tea we're, we're still enjoying this thing together remember that's what we're doing here we're here enjoying this thing together you know and that's that's so beautiful um i want to be cognizant of your time and mm -hmm. and I, let me know if we don't have time for this today um but I want to, uh, one other thing that I, I definitely want to get from you today or at some point is uh, uh, the story of how you got into Gong for Cha. It's something I've been asking several people, just kind of getting a little bit of an archival look at the history of, of people who are in this space um, and how they entered the space mm -hmm. and, and, and what, you know, what drew them there. And I think we've already touched on a lot of what draws us to Gong for Cha. But if we have to save that for another day, we can. I I think I can give an abridged version of that and if we want to delve into it a little deeper because that in and of itself is a year-long journey that you know it, it took a long time to get to me actually practicing it on a regular basis 
Mm -hmm. um, we can open that up in kind of an introductory story at another time, but I can give an abridged. Sure, sure. I'll take the teaser trailer now and we'll, we'll just have to talk again and have tea again soon. Yeah, no, that would be awesome. And I, I look forward to hearing others' perspectives on their journeys too. That's one of the joys of Am Gong Fu Chao. Yeah. Absolutely. But um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm a potter and I've been making ceramics for about 11 years as of August. And so it's been a decade long journey that would take probably um, a book to really me wanting to write that down because I've learned so much through potters. The community of potters are so generous and there are the potters who don't want to share their experiences on how they work with different techniques and they hoard it. And then the majority of the community though, are they want to share everything. They make pots because they want to make things for people to enjoy food from, enjoy drink from. And they want to, and that's part of the culture is the, pract the practicality of it. And so my love of pottery began because it was challenging and it was hard to make pots. I struggled with it more than everybody else in, in the class. I went to the University of the Pacific to learn painting. Um, and I had been doing that for about four years. And I was, uh, so, but all the painting classes were closed. Uh, not closed, they, were, they weren't occurring because the teacher who taught painting was on sabbatical. So they said, I said, oh, well, that's really unfortunate. Um, I guess I can get to painting like next term. He goes, no, the instructor's gone for the whole academic year. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really <laughs> unfortunate. But then they said, you know what? Our ceramics instructor is a painting instructor too. He painted for years. He said, but if, according to your transcript, you also are a sculptor. I had worked with stone, with metal. I had worked with heavy mediums. 10 years previous, I had focused on learning several art mediums. I had just spent like about six to eight years in community college learning several forms of art. And by that time, I had at least an intermediate understanding of several art forms. And so he said, why don't you go to the ceramics instructor and you can learn um, some pottery. And at that time, I was very stereotypically against pottery pottery as an art form. I thought, you know what, this isn't an art. You know, I had, I carried the stereotype of that. And ironically, what humbled my mindset was the fact that it was the hardest thing that I possibly learned. It kicked my butt several times and I was so frustrated. And I just, I suddenly was just like, oh my goodness, this is ironic <laughs> that the thing that I, I, um, I actually, um, um, degraded was the thing that actually is forcing me to actually realize my own doubts mm -hmm. you know and so I thought this is no coincidence that I can't learn this I'm not being humble enough you know clay humbles you mm -hmm. and so if you walk in without a humble attitude it will kick your butt and it will hold you to the ground until you suddenly realize I need to listen to the clay I need to practice. I need to understand the medium, the malleability of it, and the humility of it. And I fell in love with the idea of making cups. Cups, if I wanted to sketch a form, a concept, if I wanted to test glazes, I would make cups. And I started selling those cups at sales, at the school, online, and people fell in love with the cups and they would send me a message saying, I love using your cup for morning coffee or for my matcha or for this or for that. And I started falling in love with cups. The idea that you, that you hold them to your mouth, you know, and you have to put your face into it and it's in proximity with your lips. And it's an intimate thing and you're helping to give a person nourishment and that and the cup became an extension of the person who made it. And so I started realizing the nuances of that. And naturally that led to an appreciation of the Japanese tea ceremony. And so I started making tea bowls, a lot of tea bowls, better understanding that process. And for four or five years, that's what I did was understanding tea bowls and the philosophy behind um, Ichigo Ichie, one meeting, you know, like one time, one meeting, no, and one experience will be the same. So the tea bowls became less and less 
pro you know a product and more individually unique and more a reflection of the earth and i started learning just in, in a way healing my preconceptions of pottery and about the and about that medium and learning that it at its core is the ultimate expression of function being the ultimate expression of understanding one another because we're making things for each other and so that elevated art for me personally over the course of the journey and kept me going and then when i went to grad school and this is the part where we get to the gong fu chop part i told you that even the abridged version was going to be still like a little long but hmm. um 2016 i went to grad school and i met jonathan Steele, uh who is a really talented potter um uh uh, Steel uh, T Studios on Instagram, really, really awesome guy. I recommend you check out his wood fired work. Um, he was making teapots and making these um, really sculptural wall pieces for graduate school, and we shared the same studio. And one day, he pulled out this little teapot and this little piece of uh, this little chunk of pour, and said, "Hey Shiloh, come over here." Uh, um, let's have a little tea. And I was like, what? why is the teapot so small? You know, I started like getting curious and me and Jonathan sat there for like what I thought was going to be like 10 or 15 uh, minutes. And we just started talking about the experience about life and about the problems we were experiencing and the connection we had between us because of ceramics. And Jonathan just masterfully from his, he had learned tea culture from Richard Brandt, who's another awesome potter in Oregon and has studied all over um, Asia, all over India with varied po potters in China, J Japan. He studied with, uh, J Jonathan studied with him and he had been practicing Gong Fu Cha in Spain and all kinds of places he had traveled to. And so Jonathan at that point, he was, tea would just flow. He would just talk and just express tea almost like it was a language. He was fluent in it. And all of a sudden, um, I said, this is a really beautiful thing. This is wonderful. I've never experienced anything like this. And Jonathan said, um, well, here, why don't you have a little bit of this tea? And do you have anything at home that you can use to make it? I said, um, no. He said, well, um, and so I started researching, you know, vessels. And I purchased my first uh, tea vessel in like summer of 2016, um, I met with Jonathan in March. That's when we had our first tea session. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I started just having tea with people in the studio with my little Ishing uh, Gaiwan. <laughs> mm. Very, very, uh, very. Uh, and, I, and then uh, eventually I purchased a porcelain Gaiwan. And those are my two pieces that I would use to serve tea to people in the studio. And eventually I started teaching ceramics there after I graduated and um, me and Jonathan obviously we graduated we moved out of the studios and uh, we and we would still have tea we both lived in Oregon at the time um, and I started teaching at the same school and so um, that connected me to people that while I was teaching pottery it had an application through tea and people saw that it connected them to the process of making getting the, the teapot to pour properly, making the handle so that way it reflected comfort across the entire vessel. And so that was the, uh, so that connected them to the process. And eventually I started getting a, a reputation for being the tea guy, you know, just the one that people could go to for like really good tea and to calm down. So eventually that started being my, uh, a nom de, a uh, no, Nom de guerre, nom de plume, you know, the sense of like, that was my, that was my hidden name. You know, that was like mm -hmm. the, the people just described to me, you know, they were just like, this is the tea guy. And that I started. The reputation that preceded you. Yes, right. Exactly. It started to, people started aligning that with my identity. Mm -hmm. And by that time I was, um, my academic self started looking at Meili uh, videos Mm -hmm. And starting to understand, because if this is the social aspect of it, what is the technical side that really helps us to find the really good tea? So then I started, I watched Mayleaf's full masterclass series, and I did dedicate a whole year to just 
understanding tea, the tea, you know, just uh, the, you know, the, you know, the season, the cultivar, origin, picking, elevation, processing, I mean, all those elements, I would spend a little time every day learning about it. And, and then by that time, I was going to a national conference and for a ceramics. And that's where I met Jackson Lee of Sandbell Studio, who said, you know, we're having a tea and cultural ceramics opportunity in Kishwambana. And you know what, um, we're looking for people who are really passionate about tea. And so I talked to him about Pu'er for 20 minutes. And then I suddenly stopped and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk to you about it this long. But uh, he said, no, that's exactly what we need. Will you be our um, delegate? Will you be our, you know, for the United States on tea and pottery? And that was how I got to China for the first time. So tea literally led me into understanding a, a larger world. So, and by that time I was fully invested. So that's essentially, that's the abridged version of my, of my introduction into a Gong Fu Cha culture. Wow, thank you so much Shiloh for sharing that with us. This is really, really, really awesome to hear your story. It's, it's actually funny to hear that tail end of it, your story about Jackson Lee kind of finding you where you were because I just talked to Mary Cotterman um, I just, I was just talking with Mary Cotterman yesterday and she had a similar story of being in Chaozhou and working on pottery and Jackson Lee just like showed up at her shop and was like, Hey, I think you should come study with me in Jingda Jun, you know, like, or whatever. And so interesting, starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together in some ways. Um, but, but yes, thank you so much for that, that abridged version of your entry into Gong Fu Cha. It's a fascinating entryway i love that it came through this this style of pottery which i i or you know this art form of pottery because i feel so much like gong fu cha and chinese tea was was the 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 vehicle through which i came to understand uh, understand and appreciate pottery in in whatever amount that i do which is still very much a beginner understanding but um I too held a similar like stereotype about pottery that it wasn't really worth my time or whatever. And through Gong Fu Cha and, and, and coming into contact with all of these nicely made wares that make this practice so beautiful and so, um, so, so personal to me, you know, um, I was able to kind of grow in an appreciation for and an understanding of pottery. And ultimately that led me to a friendship with you. So there we go. Um, that, I think that's a great place to wrap up for the day. Um, I, re I really have enjoyed this conversation immensely as I always do with you, my friend. It's been great to be able to hang out with you in the tea class with Ray recently and to, to, to get to talk a couple of times this year um, over, over this uh, Zoom. <laughs> this is just a Zoom medium that uh, is becoming a lifeline when used in a balanced way. We're learning about technology now in ways that uh, we weren't aware of previously. And uh, yeah, we're increasing our awareness. Slowly. Absolutely. Well, um, until next time, my friend, uh, have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And, uh, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. And uh, take care. Give my best to the West. China Tea Fam, and uh, yeah, we'll look forward to uh, uh, next time. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye, my friend. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.